There's a little ring up here that somebody found this morning. It actually is very small. You either have a small finger or this is a child's ring, okay? So it's right up here in the pulpit. In fact, it looks like a, almost like a, like a light blue uh, little gem that might be. Yes, I had to put my glasses on. Go ahead and laugh. Uh, looks like a little blue gem that's on, on top of it here. But it's right on the pulpit, and if you're interested in it, uh, please, uh, or I mean, not interested in it. If it's yours, <laughs> I need to rephrase that. I, I want to get to my message, but if it's yours, come up and grab it, okay? And uh, praise the Lord. All right, let's get to the message here. First Corinthians chapter 1, please. First Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, let me just do a little, before, while you're turning there, let me just do a little house cleaning here. Uh, Debbie, did you bring your camera? Okay. If you are a leader of a ministry, I need you to see Debbie Freed tonight. Deacons, trustees, you lead a ministry, please get back there and see Debbie, and she'll tell you what it's all about, okay? But God bless you for that. That's a big help. First Corinthians chapter number 1. I want you to look here, if you would, just uh, one verse that I want you to see here. It is in verse number 30. He says here, after telling us about the difference between the wisdom of this world and what is considered of God's choosing, what the world's going to look at as foolish. And how he says that there are certain people that God chooses that the world would just throw away. In fact, I, I, I think about Eric's testimony. And I think about Eric and, and, and looking at his life and thinking, you know, I, I can't believe that God would, would continually call me and, and call me. And you feel like you have nothing to offer, but yet it's God that calls you. And I want you to notice here that that's God's calling. He doesn't choose those who are mighty, those that are of nobility. He chooses the weak things of this world. The things that the world just basically puts off to the side. And he does it, I love verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. See, none of us can walk around and go, hey, God's lucky he's got me. No, no, we're, if I can just use that same word, we're lucky we have God. Now, I don't believe in luck, but we're fortunate here to be able to have God. But look at verse number 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Now, the day that you got saved, here's what Jesus became to you doesn't mean that instantaneously all these things were like made you a super Christian, but you had everything available as you tapped into who Jesus was. So Jesus came in your life and he's been made unto you. Look at these four words, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You know, all of this Christian life, here's what's happening. You're figuring out the wisdom that Christ is to you. You're growing in the sanctification as you separate from the world and as you separate unto Jesus. You're learning the righteousness that has been given to you in Christ as well as the redemption of your body, that someday there's going to be a final glorification, a redemption of your body in heaven. What a beautiful thing. Jesus Christ is every bit of that to us. With this verse here, let's go ahead and pray. Our Father, we thank you for this uh, study here tonight on 1 Corinthians. I pray that you would open up the Word of God to us in a very real and special way. In Jesus' name, amen. I really believe that the key, as we do tonight, this overview on 1 Corinthians, I believe that the key to understanding the whole book is the verse that I just read to you. Of him ye are in Christ Jesus, who has been made unto us wisdom, 
righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now, let's just think for just a moment who Paul is writing to. Yes, he's writing to a group of people who have gathered together as a church in the city of Corinth, but you have to understand this group of people. They were a group of people that had severe and varied problems, and Paul is writing to them to deal with all of these problems. Now, no doubt this church was in the midst of a very wicked and perverse culture. To understand the Corinthian culture was to understand uh, much of the wickedness of that day. And whatever you and I face today, there were some of the similar things that they faced there in Corinth. And yet I must say that in the midst of such a wicked and perverse culture, the only sufficient answer to the issues that they were faced was found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul didn't share with them, look, here's how you overcome the culture. You do this and do that and, and kind of parrot some of the things of the world. No, what Paul was basically saying is the first thing is a relationship with Jesus and Jesus has made unto you wisdom and sanctification and righteousness and redemption and that is the answer for this culture. You say, Pastor, I don't understand all the things that are going on in this world. It really puzzles me, all that stuff, and I don't know how to combat that. You know what? You may only be one person, but I'll tell you what, you are one person who can live for Jesus and can make a difference in your world. And as you influence your world, your world will influence another community, and that community will influence another community, and things begin to happen. But you take that one influence that you have, you live for Jesus, and God will do some mighty things through you. He will. So tonight, let's take and explore this book of 1 Corinthians and see how we can apply some of these truths to our lives. First of all, number one, the attributes of 1 Corinthians, the attributes of 1 Corinthians. There's two things we always go over. We go over the author. Well, right up front, who's the author of Corinthians? Well, we're introduced off the bat, verse 1, chapter 1, Paul. First word, first name given, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God at Corinth. Notice that. Paul identifies himself as the writer. Now, Paul had founded this church on his second missionary journey. He writes to them while he's on his third missionary journey. And we believe, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8, Paul is writing from the city of Ephesus and he had already written to them one time concerning the matter of fornication. Now, we're going to look at that. Chapter number 5, Paul is dealing with some sin that is in the church. But it's interesting to note, and I'll just briefly share this. I did this on one of the Wednesday nights. There are four total letters that we believe Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. There is one letter that Paul wrote before 1 Corinthians. We don't have that letter. But Paul alludes to it. He talks about how he dealt with something in a previous letter. Then from Ephesus on his third missionary journey, Paul writes 1 Corinthians. Then there is another letter that Paul writes. Again, we don't have that letter. Then 2 Corinthians he writes. So a total of four letters, two of them have been preserved for us today that God has given to us. Now let's talk about the outline of the book of 1 Corinthians. Going back to our text, there's a couple of different ways to outline the book of Corinthians. It's, it, it, there's an outline I was going to give to you, and it was longer, and I promised you I was going to try to keep our outline short. So this is within four major points, but it's utilizing our text tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Remember the four words here in 1 Corinthians 1, 30? If you have to look, let's do it. What are the four things Christ has made unto us? Number one, wisdom. Number two, righteousness, number three, all right, and number four. All right, now, notice this outline of First Corinthians. First of all, wisdom. When you look at chapters one through four, true wisdom is not found glorying in other Christians. It's found in glorying in the cross. True wisdom 
is found in Christ. It's not found in our culture. You see, you look at the first few chapters, chapters 1 through 4, what does Paul knock off in the first chapter? They got all these divisions. They have some people saying, hey, we're following Peter. Some are saying, we're following Paul. People liked Apollos. He was quite a preacher. We're following him. And then there was a real spiritual group that said, we're following Christ. Paul said, no, no, that's the wisdom of this world. In the world, you have all these political factions. In the world, you have all this division. But within the church, there's to be a unity. Understand the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of this world. Christ is made unto us wisdom, and as you grow in that wisdom, you find out you're not following the things of this world, you're following the ways of God. That's chapters 1 through 4. But now Christ is made unto us righteousness. In chapters 5 and 6, the second point of our outline, here's what we find of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made unto us righteousness. Now, he gave us his righteousness, and that is when Jesus looks at you now as a Christian, whose righteousness does he see? Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? But now, as I grow in the things of God, I am learning more to live in that righteousness. But Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and 6 deals with some very practical areas. Chapter 5, we're going to get to it in a few moments. He deals with the sin of fornication. Can I say if there's any sexual immorality and sin, you're not living in the righteousness of Christ. You're living in your own righteousness, if you will. You're living in the way of this world. Chapter 6, Paul deals with the settling of problems in the secular court. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, but here it is. These believers were suing one another, and they were going before these uh, unsaved judges, and they were bringing all of their matters before the world. And Paul says, I want you to recognize something. Jesus has made unto you righteousness. But now the third area is sanctification. This is chapters 7 through 14. Paul begins to deal with all sorts of doctrinal and behavioral issues. And you know what the answer is for all of this? It's a sanctification of the Lord Jesus, of, of us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 15, the last thing is redemption, the resurrection of our bodies. Because of the Lord's resurrection, which again, what does 1 Corinthians 15 deal with? It's the proof text for the resurrection of Christ. Because Christ was resurrected, you and I look forward to the redemption of our body. The redemption of our body is just as sure as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, again, a simple outline utilizing 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 30. Now, let me analyze, second major point, the analysis of 1 Corinthians, the analysis of 1 Corinthians. There's a few things that I want to go ahead and give to you to help you understand 1 Corinthians. Now, there's no way we can go over everything. It, it'd be nice to deal with all the issues, but that'd be a whole series. But I'm going to just pick out a few that I think will help us. Number one, I want to talk about Paul's reproof of problems in the church. Paul's reproof of problems in the church. Now, as mentioned earlier, this was a letter in which Paul was addressing problems. Now, there's a general way that you might give a loose outline to the book of Corinthians in how Paul dealt with issues. In fact, there are two Greek words that are used, and I'm going to show you how it's translated in the English. It is the Greek words peri day. And what it means is, Paul is coming to something, and he says, now concerning. That's the translation in English of peri day. Now concerning this problem, and he deals with it. Would you look with me at 1 Corinthians? I'll, sh I'll show you this. Chapter number 7. Look at verse number 1. Notice how he starts off here. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it's not good for a man to touch a woman. So you know what he does? He deals with issues concerning marriage. Now concerning. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. 
now as touching things. Now, it's translated different in English, but guess what the Greek words are? Peridae. Same as chapter 7, verse 1. Look over a few other chapters, chapter 12 and verse number 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. So you see what Paul's doing here? He's basically, we we could give a loose outline to, to the book of 1 Corinthians by this matter as Paul is dealing with these issues. Now concerning this issue. Now concerning this issue. Now concerning this issue. But I want you to look a little bit further, not just in the outline that Paul gives, but in the way Paul deals with problems. I think all of you have lived long enough to realize there's a good, proper way of dealing with problems, and there's an improper way. And an improper way of dealing with problems creates a bigger mess than when you first started. And Paul has a great way of approaching the problems that are given to him about the Corinthian believers. How does Paul deal with the problems? I mean, people that are committing immorality, lawsuits before unbelievers, misuse of the gifts that are given, the the speaking in tongues, everything's out of order in the church, they're abusing the, the Lord's table. All of these things are abused. Here's what Paul does. First of all, Paul analyzes the problem thoroughly. He looks at it from all angles. He gathers the the facts together and he looks at it. And then he comes down and he exposes the root issue. He comes back to the very thing that is the problem. And then he gives biblical truth to correct it. So he analyzes it. He comes to the root issue, and then he gives biblical truth to correct the problem. How does he do that? Go, if you will, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me show you how Paul deals with the problem of fornication, the problem of immorality in the church. Now, remember the first thing? He analyzed the issue. How does he do that? Look at verses 1 and 2. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. You are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. So notice how Paul analyzes this. First of all, he says, this is something that's within the church. I mean, it's going on. People that say they are a part of your church, it's going on in there, and you haven't even dealt with it, all right? Then he analyzes it this way. He says, the sin that's in the church is of such a nature that you wouldn't even find people out in the city of Corinth doing what you're doing. That's how much of a problem it is. And then he says this, here's what the issue is. It is committing this act with this man's father's wife. Probably it was a stepmother that was here. But then notice how he exposes the root issue. Here's the root of it. Paul names a sin. He analyzes it. He says, here's what it is. Here's the problem. But do you know what the root issue is? The Corinthian believers didn't deal with it. They kind of you understand, sweeping under the rug? They kind of put it aside and they say, well, you know, that's a big problem and we'll just kind of tiptoe around this. We're not going to deal with it. Paul says, look, if I was there in the flesh, I would deal with this. The root problem was they were letting it go. But now, Paul, how does he correct it? Well, look at verse number five, if you will. He says, If I were there with you, I would tell you to do this, and I'm telling you right now, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why? That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He's basically two things here. And then notice here, verse number seven, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Sometimes we read verse number five and we say to ourselves, what's Paul saying here? I mean, we're delivering somebody over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Here's what Paul's saying. This person, probably a saved person, but in order for them 
to come to a place where they realize the error of their way and their sinful life, it is important that they are brought out to a place where Satan can have at them to where their body might be destroyed, there may be problems in their life, but hopefully they'll come to the bottom of things where they'll look up and say, Lord, I got to change my ways. And for them to be, for that person to be tolerated in this way, they don't think anything about their sin because everybody is accepting of what they're doing. And Paul is saying, no, you've got to remove this in order that the whole church might be saved as well. There has to be a purity within the body. And that's imperative. And I I wish I had more time to deal with this, but let's move on to a second area of analyzing the book of 1 Corinthians, and that is lawsuits among believers. Look at chapter 6, if you will. Paul says in verse number 1, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? If ye then have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Now please understand something. Paul is not saying here in this chapter that you can never take legal action at all. That's not what you're to read into this. I have understood sometimes there have been people that have had to take legal action for various reasons, but here's what the passage does say. There are two people in the church here, let's just use Calvary Baptist, they're doing business together and something goes awry. What's the immediate thought in our world is, you know what, that person did me wrong, I'm taking them to court. Well, think about this. You've got two believers within a church who have had a problem with one another, and how do they deal with it? The Bible tells us how to deal with problems. But instead of dealing with it biblically and having someone within the church or another believer to be an arbiter for this, they go before an unsaved judge who What's their thought of Christianity? Hey, everything should be hunky-dory with Christians. They ought to be getting along because they're saved. And then all of a sudden, we air our dirty laundry before the unsaved judge. And it's a poor testimony. That's what Paul's dealing with in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He's ultimately asking us to consider two things. You read this chapter, here's the two things to consider. If you have a matter... Take it before a group within the church. In other words, don't air your dirty laundry before the unsaved. But Paul gives another one, and this is harder a harder pill to swallow. Take the wrong. It's quiet out here. You know, in our world today, nobody wants to take the wrong. I'm standing up for my right. Nobody's going to walk over me. What if Jesus said that before he went to the cross? Think about it. Jesus hung there and died in your place and took all the ridicule and the shame so you could have salvation. And you know, we as Christians, if we learn to be more little and humble in our little state and take the wrong, I want to tell you something. God has a way of righting every wrong. He has a way of turning things around, and he'll do a better job than you will do, guaranteed. Number three, would you notice this? Christian liberty. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Now, before I get to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Christian liberty, let me give you the issue that Paul was dealing with with the Corinthians. There were animals that were offered as sacrifices in pagan temples. Some of the meat was used for the sacrifice, but the rest of the meat that was not used in that sacrifice would be sold in the market. Now, 
Jewish people and Jewish markets, they were very careful and stringent about that which was offered various things, and they knew which meat could be used and which couldn't. But we're talking Corinth, a Gentile city, having no consideration of any of that type of stuff, and they're just like, look, it's meat, we're selling it, here's hamburger, here's pork, here's this, take it. But some of it had been offered to idols, and boy, there's a great concern in the church about what should happen. You see, there was a group of Corinthian believers who would not eat of that meat because of its association. That meat had been part of an animal that that animal had been offered as a sacrifice to these particular idols. But then there was another group on the other side that would see nothing wrong with it because they realized the idols that this meat was sacrificed to was nothing but a lump of clay or wood. That's it. That idol was nothing. There's nothing to that. So it's no problem. We eat. So you can see now there's both sides. One side says, you can't eat that meat. The other side says, yeah, it's okay. There's nothing wrong. I mean, these idols are nothing. So there's a faction within the church, and Paul addresses Christian liberty. Look at verse number 1. Paul levels this issue right off the bat in verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, here's how Paul addresses it. We know, so he's talking to those who say, you know what, idols are nothing. We know that we have all knowledge. But look at this. Knowledge puffs up, but charity, what is charity? Love, that's the highest form of love. Love or charity edifieth. You know how Paul addresses this? It is not what I know. It is whether I will demonstrate love for my brother in Christ. You see, the group that were on this side that was said, oh, come on, the idols are nothing. Just go get the meat and just eat it and have fun. Enjoy yourself. Paul said, no, you think that because you have this knowledge about an idol that an idol is nothing. Knowledge is not the key. The real key of the Christian life and of Christian liberty is do I have love? And notice the word love he used, charity. What's that love? Agape love. That's the highest form of love. It's a love that husbands ought to have for their wives. It's a love that we ought to have for one another that we consider other, good, other people's well-being more than myself. You know what we have in Christian circles today? I got a right to do that. I'm going to do it. I have a right to be able to dabble in this. There's nothing wrong with this area. I don't care what other people think. I'm going to do this because I have Christian liberty. The question is not what you know. The question is whether you have love for your fellow believer in Christ. And while Paul does agree with the fact that it is doctrinally correct to say that an idol is nothing, look at verse number 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered and sacrificed into idols, he appeals to the group who knows this. He says, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. While he may agree here that they are doctrinally correct, it is important that we not do certain things that would hurt the conscience of another believer. Look at verse 9. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block. Now, I think we all get that. My grace, my, my Christian liberty, I, I know I can do It's okay that I can do this. doesn't hurt my conscience. No, but it might be a stumbling block for somebody else. So he says, it's a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. What he's saying here is, 
If that weaker brother sees you who has the knowledge, there's nothing wrong with that meat offered to idols. Those idols are nothing. He sees you, and then he goes forward. It might crush him as a Christian. It might hurt him in such a way. And Paul goes on to say that this type of liberty, really notice this, verse 12, but when ye sin so against the brethren, that is the weaker brothers, you're sinning against them, you're wounding their weak conscience. He says, you sin against Christ. Now, I love what Paul does here. He gives the example in verse number 13. He says, wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend. Look at these next words. I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now that's some lonely preaching in a lot of churches. Because we are living in a time where everybody says, I got my rights. I want to do what I want to do. But I'll tell you, you look through 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23, chapter 10, verse 24 and 29, Paul gives the example that he is not willing, though he knows it would be okay, he's not willing to do it because he does not want to hurt the conscience of weaker brothers. Now, there's much more we could deal with this, but I must move on. I want to talk now about the the next point here of an analyzing, I want, to, want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would, please. I want to talk about the trio of 1 Corinthians 12 and f- through 14. Now, what do I mean by the trio? I'm talking about these three chapters. You might mark this down. Chapter number 12 deals with the gifts of the Spirit are given. Chapter number 13, I'll bet you know what 1 Corinthians 13 is all about. How many can shout out what 1 Corinthians 13 is about? Love. 1 Corinthians 14 has to do with tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Now, let me just say right off the bat, we're not going to talk about tongues really tonight. I don't believe that tongues are for today. Just very simple. I don't believe that tongues are for today. I believe that it was for a very particular time. But there were certain gifts of the Spirit that faded off the scene. Now, does that mean that I don't believe that God could use that at any time? No, I believe that God could do anything. I believe that if God wanted to give the gift to somebody to speak to a Chinese man in, uh, with the Chinese language, I believe God could give them that gift, but I haven't, I haven't really seen that. But 1 Corinthians 12 is the gifts 1 Corinthians 13 is love. 1 Corinthians 14 is tongues and the interpretation of tongues. But notice how these three chapters really fit together like hand in a glove. Sometimes we approach these three chapters as three separate subjects. But I'm here to tell you they're to be grouped together. Think about this. Chapter 12 gives us the concept of gifts. Chapter 14, skip over 13, gives us the proper use of gifts. What's chapter 13 all about? It reminds us that the gifts are no good without love. I don't care how capable of a person you are. You might be able to teach the Word of God, but the Bible says if you don't have love, your gift is no good. You might have the gift of administration. You might have the gift of giving. But if you have no love attached with it, that gift almost becomes useless. That's how these three fit together. Let me just give this to you, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but I at least want to whet your appetite And that is my third point, the announcement of Christ in 1 Corinthians. There's two things that you could look at as a further study. First of all, Jesus is the foundation of ministry. You know what everything's built upon? Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 12, Jesus is the foundation of ministry. Second thing I want you to see, letter B, Jesus' resurrection 
is critical to the gospel message. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Paul says, I deliver now unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Let me come to the application, and I'll be done here. A couple of things I share with you and that I think would help us in our Christian life. First of all, <clears throat> you and I, look at chapter 1 if you would, please. Go back to chapter 1. Number 1, we are laborers together. We are laborers together. In this first chapter, as I mentioned at the beginning of the message, Paul is dealing with this division. He basically summarizes it's, it's wrong to have this division in the church. How sad. This group's over here, this group's over here, that group's over there, they don't intersect. And I want to tell you something, you and I must realize it's not us, it's not who we follow, it's really God who does it. He gives the example how you and I, if he, he uses the, 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 uh, the agricultural setting, you and I on the farm are literally farmhands. But who allows the crop to grow? It's God. I mean, some of us are involved in the, in the preparing of the soil. Some of us are involved in the planting. Some of us are involved in the watering. But I want to tell you, I can't produce the fruit. Only God can. So why is there division? Oh, I, I, we follow this person. Or we follow that person. No, that ought not to be in a church. I'll tell you, if there's anything that I really strive for as a pastor is that our church is unified together. That we're all on the same page. Paul even talks about the area of building, construction. He says, look, all of us have our part in building. Some may do the frame, some may do this, but guess who the foundation is? It's Jesus Christ. And so how important it is for us to understand. But now I want you to go to chapter 2. Let me give you a second application. We're laborers together, yes. Actually, this laborers together, you know, this goes beyond our church. You know how sad it is today how splintered Christianity is? Now, I'm not talking about general Christianity, that those that have fallen away from some key doctrines. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about independent, conservative Baptists that are like us. And it seems like we, instead of shooting the gospel gun and trying to go after the devil and trying to reach people with the gospel, here's what we do. We shoot at one another. We criticize other ministries, or I shouldn't say we because I, I don't want to be involved in that. But I've heard plenty of preachers. They take their, their Sundays and they talk about this other independent Baptist preacher and that other conservative preacher. And they don't do things like we do as if they are the standard. My friend, God's the standard. This book shows us how it's to be done. And however other people do it, they stand before God. And I have plenty to do to preach through this book than to worry about how everybody else is doing things. That's the same. We're really, we're laborers together. That's why I've been glad we've been able to fellowship with some of these other good conservative Baptist churches and been able to fellowship with them. But notice chapter number two, the second point, and Brother Noah's been waiting for me on the second point. Thank you, brother. I want you to notice the pattern of preaching the pattern. I wish I could show you in chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, there are three different words. It's translated preaching in the English, but there are three different Greek words that are used for preaching. And you know what it all comes back to? It's all about the message. It's about the cross. If preaching isn't about Jesus and the cross of Calvary and points people to Calvary, then it's not preaching. 
because all preaching ought to point to that. But notice, if you will, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, notice the message that Paul preached. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I want you to notice the message of preaching. It's of divine origin and not human intellect. Don't look at how you can improve the message. Yes, I, I mean, I understand in preaching. I, I want to do the best that I can to communicate, but I want to tell you, if I get up here and stammer and stutter and, and I lose my way, I want to tell you something. You ought to be able to walk away and say, you know what? He preached about Jesus. Now, you better hope I don't stammer and stutter and various other things, but notice now the method, verses 3 to 4. Notice how Paul comes. He says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He says in verse 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now think about this. How in the world does Paul reconcile here verse 3 where he comes in weakness and fear and much trembling? And how does he correspond this with the power of preaching? Here's what it is. The power is not in the preacher. It's not in how eloquent I am. It's not in the, the illustrations that are given. It's not in the outline that is used. I'm here to tell you it is the Spirit of God that takes the message of God and translates it to the people of God. Amen. You know what's amazing here? J. Sidlow Baxter, and I quoted him last week, here's what he said, the power is in the preacher, but the demonstration is in the hearer. The Holy Spirit is that invisible connection between the two, and that alone is how our spiritual effects are wrought. But the motive, we've got the message, we have the method, and the motive is the growth of God's people, verse number 5. But now I come to the last thing, chapter 1, verses 17 to 29, and that is the description of those whom God uses. The description of those whom God uses. Notice the five words used to describe those who God uses. In verse, beginning here, if you will, in verse number 27, he uses the foolish things, the weak things, the base things, the things which are despised, and the things which are not. Now, if somehow you fall into one of those and you say, well, I'm what the world would be considered foolish. The world thinks, oh, you're a fool for following Jesus. You're a good candidate to serve God. If you sense your weakness and you say, I don't know if I can do anything for God, then you're ripe for God's choosing. If you're something that is base and, and you just feel like, you know, I, I've never attained anything, there's nothing I've ever been done, then I want to tell you something. That's where God comes and says, I, I can use that. You're the things that are despised by the world. The world just puts you aside and says, oh, we don't want any of that. That's what God uses. And I want to tell you, you're looking at a preacher here who really has nothing except for God. Every time I get before this pulpit, I come before God and I say, God, I have nothing of myself, but it's all you. And when you minister, when those of you who work with the children in the vacation Bible school, and maybe you're getting ready to teach or you're doing something, you say, I, I, Brother Scott came to me and he basically collared me into doing this. I don't know if I can do it. Oh, that's where God likes to come in. God's going to bring you along and you say, I'm weak. I'm despised by the world. I have no ability. I want to tell you something. You may not have any ability all God is looking for is availability. 
God's looking for you to raise your hand and say, I don't have a whole lot to offer, but God, if you'll use me, I'm here. I'm here. And I want to tell you something. That's what God does. All God's looking for you is for you to raise your hand and say, God, I want to be used by you. Isn't it amazing to look through Scripture and see what God's done? The creator of the universe chose to use dust to make you instead of using uranium. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. He didn't speak through a large cedar tree. God chose to dwell in a skin-covered tabernacle instead of one of the large temples of the world. During the time of the judges, Samson used the jawbone of a little donkey to kill a thousand enemies of the Lord. When David was just a boy, God allowed him to defeat Goliath with a sling and a simple, smooth stone. The Lord Jesus, while on this earth, was able to use the gift of a little boy to feed the multitude. And what was that gift but five loaves and two fish? God chose Moses even though he complained about not being able to speak and not being able to lead the children of Israel, but God showed his power through Moses. God chose a man by the name of Gideon who was hiding in fear to lead the Israelites against their enemies. God chose a little shepherd boy by the name of David to be the next king of Israel, even though all outward signs would have pointed to one of the older siblings. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, when God is talking about Israel, God says, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you are more the number than all the other people, for you are the fewest of the people. God is just looking for those who want to be used by him. And why? Because as the passage says, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but that God would receive all the praise. Amen. If there's anything we desire for this ministry, and I hope you're with me on this, is that whatever is done through Calvary Baptist is that God will get the praise, not us. If there's any ministry you're involved in here today, it is that God would receive the glory, not you as an individual. I'm here to tell you, God desires to use you. God might be calling you to do something right now, and whatever it is that we do, would it be that God would get all the praise and all the glory? I'm going to do something a little different for our invitation tonight. I was very moved once again by this song that was sung this morning, and I'm going to ask the team to come right now, and I'm going to ask them to sing this song because it fit very well in with this last point of our message. And when this is done, very simply, however my wife goes into an invitation, I'm going to ask you to come, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and submit yourself to God and say, God, I want to be used by you, and I want to make sure that all the praise and glory go to you. So they're going to sing. And then I'm not going to say anything, and I want to invite you to just come before God and say, God, I'm all yours. You get all the glory.
my soul will prize, regardless of the joy or trial. When agonizing questions rise, in Jesus all my hope abides. For this cause I live, for this cause I die, I surrender. Brother's eye, I pray in. 